So you can see it's connected down there? Yep. Yeah. And now your host of Where's My Parachute, it's Steve Lemieux. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming in. I got uh, Nick Hoover with us. Hey, guys. Sitting to my right. I've got back again, Rick Sapio. <laughs> <laughs> and super blessed and excited to have Mark Moses on today. Mark is author, uh, business entrepreneur, um, Iron Man runner or swimmer, runner, biker, um, and uh, and a business coach, and uh, super excited to have you on. Thanks. You bet. And Mark's in town today for uh, a gig tonight at St. Rocco's. It is Make Big Happen Dallas dot com, and Mark's uh, best selling book is Make Big Happen. So really excited to have you here today. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's get started. Let's, uh, you know, this is a show. Oh, also, uh, no hats today. We decided to ditch those because I was concerned about my uh, hair for this evening's event. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I brought my favorite hat, though. It came from did. my grandmother. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did she knit it? <laughs> she knitted it. This <laughs> is, I've had this hat for actually about 10 minutes. I bought it on the way here. There was a... <laughs> At the convenience store? Yeah, Ali sold me this hat. <laughs> nice. But it looks nice. a lot like the hat that my grandmother gave me. Perfect. All right. Um, so uh, I've I've heard quite a bit of your story. Uh, this show is uh, is to help entrepreneurs. You know, we, we sometimes we jump out, jump off the cliff or jump out the window and we realize we don't have a parachute and it's all risk and, man, we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel and the sweat and the fear and, and, and whatnot, but also the success. And, uh, and so, uh, we're here to give a little jolt to folks that are either <laughs> entrepreneurs, <laughs> entrepreneurs or, uh, or aspiring to be entrepreneurs, business owners, et cetera. Um, so, so that's what we're here for. And, and, um, I know you've got, uh, I know you've got a lot of stories, but why don't you take us through, um, you rode an elephant one time. I did. So I said to my <laughs> assistant, Jamie at the time I said Jamie we're gonna have our annual event and I'd like you to tear a wall down in our building and hire me an elephant I'd like to ride it down the street and into the annual meeting and she said man you must be under a lot of stress dude um that sounds crazy like where am I gonna get an elephant <laughs> and I said look I got a lot going on here okay can you find me an elephant or not she said uh okay okay um, she found a company called Have Trunk Will Travel, <laughs> awesome. and uh, elephant rolled in, and uh, I rode down the street into the building, and the message to the company was, if you think big and act big, you will be big. Let's do a billion dollars. How did you get the elephant in? Did you have to take a wall down or anything? We did. We had, we had to take a wall down. It had to come in on its, like, kind of on its knees. Yeah. Well, there's a video of this. Will you play it tonight at the event? I wasn't planning on playing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, at that point, they're either on the bus or off the bus, right? I mean, there's no, there's no questioning <laughs> what direction you're going and what, you, what your expectations are and what the, what the company culture is. Yes. You know, I just wanted them to think big. And we had been through a bunch of adversity prior to that. And I thought, man, what a way to get them to... Be inspired and the coolest part was you know they were laughing they were crying they were saying man you, you got issues like who does that <laughs> yeah. but the coolest part was the next day they started bringing into work with them little ceramic elephants and crystal elephants and stuffed elephants and said you might be a weird dude but we're with you that's cool it was cool that isn't is, that on the cover of the book or in the book that is super cool we, we did change our logo it, it was like a runner guy and we had to change it to the elephant because why not? <laughs> yep. I so mean, interesting fact, Steve. The book is called Make Big Happen, and I went on Amazon recently to look at it. It's the only book that I've seen where 100% of the reviews are five stars. 
there's not a single review less than five stars. And those are independent reviews. So I think there's more than 50. Couldn't believe it. But I read the book cover to cover. It's a good book. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, uh, I struggle with that in my business sometimes of, of getting people to think big enough. As a matter of fact, Nick and I were talking about it on our way here. Just, just how, you know, if, if, you, if you chase big deals, you land big deals. If you chase small deals, you land small deals, you know? You, you know, you can think about it like that concept is zero. Let's just say somebody's a uh, uh, $20 million business. What does business look like if you just throw a zero on the end of it? So now it's 200. So not that big a deal. It's, it's a big deal. 20 is a big deal. Two is a big deal. 200 is a big deal. But you can get whatever you want if you, believe you, if you believe that you can. I just had a conversation with my partner, Bill, who's sitting outside the room. Bill, we're just going to add a zero to it. Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he can hear you or not. We're, we're airtight in here. Zach, can he hear him? Probably not, huh? Gosh, I, didn't, I wasn't even ready for that. Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> we're streaming. I don't think it's streaming to that television out there, though. That's the issue. So. Right on. Well, Zach with the good radio voice is in the box today. Oh, thanks. thanks. Buddy. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, so you did a billion dollars that next year. No, not next year. It took a while. It, it did took, take a while. It took, uh, this was 1997. We didn't get it done until 2005. Okay. We did just over a billion in 2005 and 1.6 billion the next year. And then in all your wisdom and perfection as an entrepreneur and business owner, you sold at the perfect time. <laughs> Better lucky than good, man. <laughs> that's awesome. What a great story. Yeah, that, thanks. That's awesome. Now, uh, uh, no, no rough times through your, uh, through your entrepreneurial journey, all just all bright and shiny. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I heard that, um, that you were struggling one time and, and had kind of a savior swoop in and, and, um, uh, lend you some money or help, help the company keep going. Yeah, this was, this was a crazy story. We had, um, in 1998, we were making over a million dollars a month and, at, for us, at, in our early 30s, that was just big. And then October 1998, Wall Street pulled out of the liquidity markets that did our product. We had 275 people in our center in Irvine. And over the weekend, we had to lay off 240 of them. Wow. It was like, it was just so frustrating and, uh, and uh, sad. And, and we were failing. Our product was gone. It just ended overnight. And we tried to pivot and build something else on the fly. And we tried and we tried and we were just burning cash. We had burned through all the cash that we had. We borrowed money, borrowed money from family. Um, one brother said yes. One brother said no. <laughs> I still resent that a little bit. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then, uh, we ended up raising um, about a million and a half from family and friends just to try to keep it afloat. And eventually, that was it. Yeah. We were maxed out at 350000 credit card debt. And we realized we weren't going to make payroll. And this was um, October 11th in 2000. And we, had, we, had, we decided we're, we're filing for sure. And we're going to file on October 13th. Bankruptcy. Yeah. Bankruptcy. Not, yep. not, file bankruptcy. not IPO. <laughs> yeah, it definitely <laughs> wasn't an IPO. Specific. Yeah, we were going to file bankruptcy. So on that 11th, we, it was leading up to it, but that was kind of like the day we thought, that's it. My partner, my business partner at the time, goes to listen to a speaker. And this business, the speaker just sold his business for $150 million cash. And he runs up after, <laughs> when it's done, said, hey, man, that was awesome. Hey, we're going to go to business like in two days on Friday, and here's our business plan. And if, you know, if you would just consider looking at this on your flight home tonight, we don't have a lot of time, but if you could get back to us tomorrow and let us know if you could help us, uh, it'd be amazing. So next day, he comes back to us, and he's got 31 questions. Well, we got nothing to do. We're going out of business like the, <laughs> the next day. It'll be Friday, right? right? right. Friday the 13th. So they were tough questions. We answered all the questions for a few hours. You said, I'll let you know tomorrow. I said, tomorrow? Tomorrow, Friday the 13th? What time? <laughs> and he said, well, I'll let you know in the morning. It's, like, it's good because by noon we've missed payroll and, and we're done. And so he wired the money the next morning. Wow. And we sorted out the agreement um, in the weeks to come. That's awesome. 
and it turned around. It turned around. And, and was that, that, was the, that was the mortgage company. That was the mortgage company. That was a catalyst that enabled us to turn it around. But we got to within hours. We had houses up for sale, boat was up for sale, the one year was one year old was up for sale. And you know, timing's never good, right? You, this happens in we got one year old right. at eighteen months, and my wife is nine months pregnant. Right. Like she she was saying, Oh, good timing. You, <laughs> next time could you pick a little bit better timing? <laughs> So you just never know in life when it's going to happen. And that was really ugly. But we were able to rally, and we went on. It was still tough for a couple of years, but then we went on a really good ride for the next several years. It was awesome. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, I did a speech one time uh, in downtown, and, and it was on entrepreneurship, and I made up some word in Latin that, that was the, the root word of, of entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism. And uh, and I said what it means in, in literally what it means is dumbass, and you know <laughs> half the half the room laughed and the other half googled it. Um, but <laughs> seriously, but but what but you know, I think what a lot of entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs, people that want to own their own company or or that look through the lens, what they don't understand is that day that you had to lay off two hundred and some odd people, that's that's way worse than getting fired. That's way worse than getting fired yourself. I mean it, you. You know, the, the people that get fired think that's the most horrible thing, but to have to do that, especially in a layoff situation, is gut-wrenching. It was awful because our culture at the time was awesome. Yeah. It was so good, and this was such a like, – looking at myself is this is a massive failure. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. I, I interviewed a guy uh, uh, on a couple of shows ago, and he, he was talking about how his one of his companies went under – and how it was a complete reflection of him. Like he, he felt like a complete failure. He couldn't face his wife, he couldn't face his kids, and you get so connected to it that it, it, that it becomes almost who you are. You know, it's interesting. I was speaking in Dallas in, in 2008. I think that's the last time I spoke here, and a guy walked up to me in the audience. It was an event that Rick was hosting, and he said to me, um, I was at your home. On October thirteenth, two thousand. Wow, Hen Henry. Oh, and, Henry Harrison. And I said, I, I didn't even remember his name. And I said, you're at my home on October thirteenth, two thousand. This is eight years later. I have no recollection of you ever being in my home, and especially on that day. It's like, what was I doing even entertaining that day? It was just <laughs> like I felt like I was. I still taking my life jacket off. Maybe he was bringing you some food for dinner. <laughs> my goodness, it was amazing to me. He walked up to me, and I recognized him, but I had no recollection of the, him and his wife were at our home for dinner. It's amazing. No, he spent the weekend, he told me. I didn't realize he spent the whole weekend. Is <laughs> it crazy? Crazy. It was just so emotional. And That's wild. That's wild. So uh, you do Ironmans. You've done, how many have you done? Yeah, too many. Uh, I've done 12. Wow. And you've done them in some crazy places, like? Iceland or Antarctica. But just so right? we know, what is an Ironman? What do you have to do? So, yeah, good, great question. So, you swim 2.4 miles, then with, and, and it's a mass start. So, picture 2,500 or 3,000 people all. The gun goes off. Everybody's fighting for a place in the water. It's, 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 mm. we call it the washing machine. Then you ride your bike 112 miles. So, just picture that. that if it sounds far in a car, imagine how it feels like on a, in a on bike, right? <laughs> And then when you're done that, you run 26.2 miles, a full marathon. It's a pretty long day. It's like, a, well, for some, it's a really long day. Uh, for me, it's about a 12-hour day. For some, that's a, that's a long month. <laughs> uh, I do the Italian triathlon. That's a 40-minute massage, then an hour in a sauna, and then uh, an hour in the jacuzzi. Yeah. <laughs> and that's after you mowed your lawn? <laughs> so uh, not that I'm one of these people, but some entrepreneurs – struggle finding their motivation to do certain things whether that's you know get on a regular schedule and you know just just the motivation behind that and it, and and I and I obviously that was a joke I, I struggle with that a lot um what what's what's the key to your motivation to your your inspiration how do you keep doing it get up at you know morning ritual whatever whatever the things that you do on a daily basis what what's that source doing what I'm passionate about yeah. It, it, to me, that is really what drives me. Okay. Do what I'm passionate about, and it do, it never feels like work. It just feels like play. 
But so, I'd be curious, what is a typical day for you? My, uh, what I get, time are you up? What do you do first? Then what? Yeah, I get up at five. <coughs> I have my, oh, yeah, I love Bulletproof. Yep, I do that in the morning. Um, I organize uh, my day at 5.40. I leave for the gym. I'm at the gym by 5.55, uh, plus or minus 30 seconds. <laughs> and then I uh, usually do an hour of cardio, depending on the week, what I'm doing. But usually an hour of cardio, and Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I work out with my trainer. Wow. That's, Rick, you got a morning ritual. I do. Same thing. But but then it, what do minus, you do? Minus the gym. <laughs> <laughs> minus the gym, the coffee, and the workout. But <laughs> what, <laughs> no, So what do you do the rest of the day? What happens after the workout? Yeah, so then it's uh, either... As an athlete and in my 50s, I'm often I, I got a few uh, little issues to work out. So Mondays is physical therapy. Uh, Wednesdays is the chiropractor. I go to cryotherapy also one of those days. Just some of the stuff makes me feel good. I stop at Starbucks on, on the way home. For the second cup? For the second cup. Nice. <laughs> and then uh, I look over what I'm going to be doing for the day, do some of my prep work. And then I typically will be coaching from 10 till about 3. And then uh, I begin to wrap up my day. Mm-hmm. And uh, about 5 o'clock, having a glass of wine with my wife. Could you tell us the story that you told me on the way here uh, about the company that called you four years ago that had $5 million in revenue? I'm talking about uh, oh, the one they- that, that went from $5 million to $180 million in four years. Oh, no, you, I think you're confusing know, this. this two you got like two stories in yeah. there that were confusing. I'll, I'll tell you both of them because they're both cool. Yeah. One of them was really cool. These young guys are 27, 5 million issue revenue. Fast forward right now, and we're, uh, we'll do between two and 220 million in revenue this year. In four years. In four years. Yeah, From, crazy, crazy story. And, and, and next year is going to be meaningfully bigger. I wouldn't be surprised we had at least another hundred million in revenue next year. We've already booked most of it, so it's a really, really cool story. But I'll tell you the other. But one. how do you make that happen? The name of your book is "Make Big Happen." How did you take a five million dollar company four years later bring them to two hundred and twenty million? Well, first it's getting it's a great question, but first getting clear on what you want. Like what what is you wake up three years from now? What is success? What what does it look like? Clearly define what it is that you want, and then this is. I'll say. Half, half of entrepreneurs or CEOs cannot do that. They'll give you an answer, and it's bad. Even if you ask them, you wake up one year from now, we're hanging out together, we're celebrating big because we achieved what? And again, I would say about half the time, it's a bad answer. But virtually everybody gets an F on the next question. And if you remember from school, an F is not a, a good grade, not Rick. Great. Yeah, right? <laughs> so what is the number one or number one or two specific and measurable activities that will lead you to the outcome that you want? And for your listeners, Steve, and if they ask themselves that question, what are the, even just one, what is the number one activity that's specific and measurable that will lead you to the outcome that you want that we can keep score on, it's really hard. Really hard. Think about that. Most people give an outcome to the answer to the question. I need to sell X amount more. Well, that sounds like an outcome. What's a specific and measurable activity that's going to drive that outcome? And then they'll probably give you another outcome, and you just keep pushing them until you get to the root activity. And keep in mind, an activity is leading. It's something that we do every day it isn't something that's an outcome even if they say well in order to achieve my goal i need to hire 10 more salespeople." okay sounds like an outcome what's a specific and measurable activity that'll drive that outcome some people will say i need to do a hundred prospect meetings great what's a specific and measurable activity that's going to get you 100 prospect meetings until you back it all the way back and if you can define that you will get what you want. So, so what's the answer to that? Hundred, hundred prospect meetings. Is that is the is the uh, is the uh, is it? 
I need to make X amount of phone calls or is that an outcome as well? Yeah, so let me give you a, a real sure. life example. A client of mine says to me last year, he's in the wealth management business, okay. says I want to do 70 million in new assets this year that I want to bring in, $70 million. So what's a specific and measurable activity that's going to drive that outcome? He said 400 prospect meetings. Okay, what's a specific and measurable activity that's going to drive that outcome? He said I need 2,000 people to attend my seminars. Okay, what's a specific and measurable activity that's going to drive that outcome? 21,000 phone calls into corporations with a population that will be retiring in the next five years. Okay, so where so does this it, whole thing it. break down, right? It's if the calls don't get made the whole thing falls apart. But we know from our data and our history, we make the calls, we know how many people will turn up to seminars, we know how many people will end up doing prospect meetings with, and we know what our conversion rate is and what the life cycle of taking our sales cycle, taking somebody from the first meeting to all the way down through the chain or the funnel to ultimately close in. So it's totally predictable. And last year, we did $84 million. So this year we said, well, that was pretty easy. Why don't we set it at $100 million this year? And then we just work the numbers back in the same way I just described. But that's the typical example. If each company can determine what their specific and measurable activity is that will drive the outcome that they want, assuming that they know the outcome, right. they have a higher probability hitting it. Yeah. And, and so uh, in your coaching, how, how many, how many uh, folks do you coach? Our firm coaches about 160 in 19 countries. Okay, and that's all. those are, those are all CEOs or... Those are all CEOs, and beyond that, we go deeper and work with, uh, within the 160, we also coach several people on their leadership teams, too. So it's 160 firms we work with. We might be working with five to eight people at, at a company. And, and is that, that, I guess, would be part of your coaching is let's drill down, let's see what your, the outcome is that you want, and then and what, what you have to do that's specific, what's a smart goal that, uh, to, or a smart activity. That will drive there. that outcome, yeah. Yeah. What, what other kind of things do you, uh, do you run into when you're coaching? Which oh, the number one mm -hmm. is, this is painful, but it's true. The people that get most firms to where they are today aren't the people that are going to take them to where they want to go. Oh, yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's true. Because when you're a $2 million business, it's a different set of people than when you're a $10 million and $20 million and $50 million and $100 million. And it's frustrating. I can, I can give you one example. The, uh, the CEO was 27, and he said, this is the best CFO I've ever had. Well, how many have you had? Well, just this one. <laughs> well, no wonder it's the best CFO you <laughs> right. ever had. He didn't know any, any different CFO. And then it took me over two years to convince him um, to get another one. And he said, oh, my God. He, it just blew his mind. He, <laughs> he didn't even know. He didn't know what he didn't know. He says, I can't believe the impact. But that rolls through in the positions that really, really matter. One is finance. The other one is the COO, whoever the, whoever's going to be in the weeds, right? Because a lot of entrepreneurs, as they're building their entity, they end up in the, we'll call it the whirlwind of the day-to-day. -day. They're in the weeds. They're too involved in the operations. <laughs> and then as they, if they don't put that right talent on, then they get sucked into it. But when they do, they go, my life is now liberated. Rick likes to say, as the, as the CEO, you ought to point. Point to somebody else to do, not do. You're the leader of the band, not the doer. So, and I think I mean, Rick probably described when he was on the show before. But it was meaningful to me on, on our podcast that we have. It was the most listened to podcast. And it, and it was Rick's. He had interviewed a... I don't know, like 40 billionaires, and was asking him what he learned from them. Yeah. What, what, what the biggest learnings were. And, and, the, and the theme I took away from that was put the people in place so you can lead, not do. Let them do their job yeah, and be the points. visionary. So they can go to CEO Coaching International and hear the podcast there. I want to point out that before you mentioned that there were two stories you were going to tell, I'd like to hear the second story. But I also want to point out that the reason you're in Dallas is tonight you're going to make a presentation at the St. Rocco's. Uh, I encourage everybody to listen to Mark, and he'll tell you how he took companies from $5 million in revenue to $200 million in revenue and beyond. It's free. 
You'll do a book signing after that, will you? Yeah, sure. Yep. Sure. So just go to www.makebighappendallas.com. www.makebighappendallas.com. Register for free. There's nothing in it other than uh, your time. So if, if this is interesting to you, imagine, Steve, it would be interesting to some people. It would be interesting. <laughs> uh, go there. But what was the second story, Mark? Yeah, the second story is cool. I was speaking yesterday to YPO in Atlanta, and one of my clients introduced me. And he, he was, he's a funny guy, and, uh, but a great guy. He's a New Yorker. And he's, he had called me up several years ago. It was in 2011. And he just lost $8.5 million, and he was on the verge of going under. And he said, will you coach me? I said, man, I'm book solid. I, I don't have any room. A week later, he calls me and says, I'm going to be in, uh, in L.A. in like next week and any chance we can get together so, well what day are you going to be here well, which day are you available <laughs> and he said he didn't really he's mm. funny when he's telling the story he didn't have a, any not. plans to be in LA so he came over to my house on a Sunday we sat out in the backyard he said I'm not leaving until you agree to take me on as a client I said man it's not going to happen but I'll sit with you and we'll get to know each other and three hours later uh, he left and I was his coach. <laughs> 39 months later, uh, we had a huge exit, nine figures, well over $100 million. And um, it, it's, it's really cool to watch a guy that is willing, had the courage to take action, the courage to replace his best friend from high school that was running sales, that worked for a company for 18 years. And he had the courage to replace him had the courage to replace the CFO, um, and it enabled him just continuing to build out his team. It did not take that long, and it, frankly, it wasn't that hard, but he was one of those guys that he knew what he wanted. He actually, uh, when we had his annual planning session, he said, the team said, well, what's your vision? And his name is Rich and uh, from North Carolina. And Rich said, my vision is to do a billion dollars. And he was running at uh, right around $100 million at the time. And the team went, oh, my God, we're all screwed up. How are we going to do that? And then we calculated the growth rate. And, the, and it, wasn't, it was in the 20-some percent. And it was like 26, 7, 8 percent to get to a billion over 10 years because of the compounding. And, like, we hit it way early. Like, we hit it in four years. That's awesome. And you, you brought something up, though. You said his best friend was there. And I got to tell all you guys – that I see the most destruction happen in businesses when they hire best friends or friends or spouses or kids or relatives. And it's very hard to grow a business with friends and ancestral relationships. It's tough. So I like to take the path of least um, friction and highest probability of success and get the best person in the world as opposed to someone that's related to you or they're friends with you. I was speaking yesterday in Atlanta, as I mentioned earlier, and there are several family businesses in the room. And we were talking about the concept, is good, good enough? And I could see by the looks on their faces that some people were buying what I was saying and some people were not. And the guys that had the toughest time with it were the family guys because they had cousins in the business, they had brothers and sisters in the business, and sometimes second, third, fourth generation businesses. That's, it's really tough to have the courage and then still be able to sit around the Thanksgiving table or, and have a family meeting without a lot of family feud. Yeah, I'm not, go ahead, Nick. So uh, how often did these people um, notice that there was problems with their CFO or their COO? Uh, you know, had things been going along smoothly or were there signs that, you know, these executives weren't? So was it, yeah, so like, so was it you that had to f figure it out? Or did you have to convince it? them? Yeah, it, d it doesn't take you long to get your arms around. Like the lowest hanging fruit for us is just ta attack the gross margin line, right? So you got to look at the financial statements to, to look at that. And if the gross margin doesn't make sense or there's a lot of opportunities or they don't understand the gross margin by customer, by product, by salesperson, like, you can easily find two, three points in a lot of businesses by looking at that. So that's one place. But – 
But what the, you're saying is this, this a bad CFO wouldn't even know those answers. So you're asking answers that they wouldn't know, and you know they're not the right person. I was talking to a guy that was interested in coaching last week from Kentucky, and I started asking him the questions. And, and this were, these were he's a marketing-driven business that generates leads. When I started asking him all the marketing questions, for example, what did it cost you to generate your last customer? And he just didn't paused. Know. He didn't know. Okay, no problem. What it would it cost you last year to generate a customer? He didn't know. Okay. Then I can't even go deep to tell me how you spend in your money, how you spend in your money. Let's go through all the sources that you spend money on and let's go by source. What's it cost you to generate a customer? He's in no clue. And by understanding the drive that's why when you go back to that uh, number one activity that will drive the outcome that you want. It flushes out all of that. Nick asked a question about, think, think about why a lot of businesses might engage coaching is they got an execution problem. So where's the execution? Well, it's either I need more revenue or I need more profit or I need to fix something in the back office, call it operations or whatever it is. They there's not many more problems that they they have. But I, I think uh, I think somebody saying that they don't need a coach is <laughs> is like, you know, saying that they uh, you know they're 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 a knower, not a learner, right? I mean, they they have no desire for any kind of personal development because, I mean, the, the most successful guys I know either have a coach or had a coach for a long time. I've been coached since I was 24. Yeah, it was awesome, and then I got another coach. It for 10 years and then another one for seven years and I have two of them right now that I've had for two years that's awesome and I don't know what life is like without one and it's even uh, a John <coughs> door from Kleiner Perkins when Eric Schmidt went to work there and, there, and there's a good YouTube the, out on this Eric w went to work for, to run Google right uh, that's what I meant went to run Google right yeah. um, and John door says you need a coach he goes I'm Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google. What do I need a coach for? And uh, um, John Doerr came back to him and said, every successful business guy or gal, every successful athlete has a coach. You yeah. need one too. It, it's, it's interesting because we talked about this in the forum and, and some of the guys start complaining about the cost, you know, and it's like, well, let's see, it's going to pay off. 50 fold <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's amazing. You, you know when guys do that i just don't even understand it. it's like don't waste money if you're going to focus on the de minimis cost right please don't waste my time go talk to somebody else i got to tell a quick story about a year ago after meeting with mark i said that one of the companies that we own the i was going to fire the ceo i said let me try to get him a coach first this guy fought me for six months what do i need a coach for i know this stuff what fought me and fought me and fought me finally i had to hold a gun to his head I said, you're out of a job or you take on a coach. He's had a coach now for six months and all he can talk about now is, wow, this is awesome. I love my coach. And his results have dramatically changed. So I don't even know what the expense is. I haven't looked. But whatever it cost, it was worth it by 10x. I think he's just saying that because you had a gun to his head and you're Rick Sapio. <laughs> <laughs> Scary guy. Right on, guys. Well, listen, I think... Uh, we better wrap up here. I know you guys got to get uh, get over to St. Rocco's. I'm going to see you there this evening. Um, but really special time. Thank you, Mark, very much for sharing. Uh, thanks for being here on the show. It was uh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you in Dallas, and I look forward to uh, the event tonight. I'm I'm excited about it. Make big Dallas. Make big happen. Dallas. dot com. Yep. Rick Sapio, thanks again for being back. And hey, thanks for letting me talk. I was, I'm, I'm very, I'm super impressed. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to get a word in. Nick, thanks, man. How'd you, how'd you like it? Yeah, well, uh, I liked it. Would have. Uh, Is that your first time? time? I'll have more input. Is that your first time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. He's a, he's a radio virgin. Yeah. <laughs> he's got to make sure he gets up to the microphone. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Zach, thanks, brother. Thanks hey. for helping us out. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening.